Hi, can you hear me? Okay, we'll start because I don't know how many will join today. So, uh, hi everybody and also happy Diwali to everybody. Hope you have a good vacation and year ahead. Can you see my screen? Yes, sir. Okay. Yeah, so as I said yesterday that let's not do maths today. I mean, not Olympiad maths at least. Let's do something interesting. So at first I did not have a lot of ideas, but then when I started to think I now have too many ideas, so I will not be able to cover everything, but uh, at least I'll give you some pointers to explore further. So, uh, I mean, in the domain of puzzles and riddles, things like that, there are many kind of puzzles that can be asked uh, related to, like there is one complete stream of puzzles which is related to chess, but I will not cover that today, but I'll encourage you to read more about this there is a topic called retrograde analysis uh, which is all about analyzing the uh, not the future of the game but actually the past events that what happened before this position and how to logically reduce what happened before those kind of puzzles are there there are some pure logic puzzles so when i say pure logic uh, basically kind of a binary logic that either a can happen or b can happen and kind of deducing from there. So within that also, we have lots of subcategories, of course, as you can imagine, like uh, a very simple kind of pure logic puzzle. I will say you may have seen this kind of example in your scholarship paper, like uh, there is some information given. Let us say that, you know, A, B, C, D, E, there are three people, uh, five people who are going to go to a movie and they are going to sit in a row. You may have seen puzzles like this, like, so we have to reduce what is the order in which they are sitting in that row. And you will be given some information that maybe B is sitting to the left of C, D and A are not sitting together, whatever, whatever. But from that, you can uniquely deduce what is the possible arrangement. So that is like a pure logic puzzle. There is a slightly higher level kind of puzzle, which is called a meta puzzle. Okay. Meta puzzle is a very interesting category of puzzle. It is also pure logic in the sense that you can uniquely deduce whatever you want from that information. But Typically, what they tell you is that they will not give you the full information. So the information given to you is not sufficient to solve the puzzle. But you are told some information like, if I tell this information to X, Y, Z person, he can solve it. And so that is kind of indirect inference you have to make. So you don't have to think about, the, of course, you have to think about the puzzle. But you have to think about how others think about the puzzle. So it is like one level higher kind of example. So uh, I will share some examples of all of this on the WhatsApp group so that you can, you know, uh, we'll have a lot of interesting things to try in the next week or so. But uh, yeah, so these are some kind of puzzles. Uh, then, uh, so today I'm going to discuss one or two puzzles of this kind, which is a uh, kind of, uh, basically we need to solve a problem. Like you need to come with an algorithm, like algorithmic puzzle. So in other words, you have to solve a problem and for that you need to come with a strategy to solve that problem. Okay, so just directly jumping into it, like what I mean by this kind of puzzle. So uh, this is a problem which maybe somebody had faced in real life. Okay, that uh, so there, there are two cities, okay, city A and city B. Okay, and they are located far away from each other. Let us say that the distance between them is 10 kilometers. Okay, so it's not very trivial to go from one place to the other. And, uh, you know, in the old days, used to have telegraph cables. We don't have, assume that we are living in, you know, 1900s where we don't have internet, no mobile. So, you know, underground, like there used to be one telegraph cable and I like the bundle inside will have individual wires right so the uh, entire bundle may comprise of multiple wires which all come uh, I mean the ends of the wires come out from both the sides okay and let us say that there are 120 wires inside this bundle okay so basically you have 120 ends coming here and 120 ends on this side 
but the difficulty is the wires are not labeled. So you don't know which end from this side corresponds to which end from that side. Okay. And as a, you are called as the engineer to solve this problem. Okay. And what you are given this equipment, which is called a circuit tester. Okay. Have you heard of this circuit tester? Okay. I'll just quickly explain what that means. So I guess in school, you must have done some basic circuits, like, you know, how to draw a battery and like basic circuits, right? So I'll just draw the diagram of the circuit tester. Basically it's a battery and uh, there is a bulb. So I, I don't know how they draw a bulb, but I'll just, so this is the bulb and uh, the other end is loose. So that's it. So like, imagine that this whole thing is inside a box. Okay. And, uh, and so these two ends are loose. So basically what will happen is that if, if there, there is a complete circuit over here, right? If this point and this point are connected, then you can join this end to this end, this end to this end, and the circuit will get completed, right? And the bulb will light up. And in case this loop is not complete, suppose there is a break in the loop somewhere. Okay. Suppose there is a break in the loop somewhere, then the circuit will not get completed. So all that the circuit tester is telling you is whether two ends are connected or not connected. Okay. So this circuit tester is available to you. And using that, what you have to do is solve this problem that, and you can take, like, you can label the wires, like the, you can attach small, you know, you can say pieces of paper to the wire and give it some number or name, whatever you want. Okay. But the end goal is that you have to match the correspondence that which wire from this side is meeting, which wire from this side, you have to find out that information. And because the distance is 10 kilometers, right? So going back and forth between city A and city B is expensive. So let us say. Like every time you make the trip from A to B or B to A, you have to pay hundred rupees. Let's say, okay. So like going from A to B costs hundred rupees and uh, coming back from B to A also costs hundred rupees. So obviously you have to save your expense. You don't want to keep going back and forth every time and still you want to solve this problem. Completely. Okay. So this is the question that you need to solve. Uh, so I'll give you some time to think. And I mean, just to make sure that everybody has understood the problem, let us do the simplest version of this problem. Let us say there are only three wires. Okay. So there are three ends coming out of this side and three ends coming out of this side. Okay. And now you have to find out at which end corresponds to which end over here. Okay. So how will you solve this problem and how, how many trips will you have to make to solve this problem? Okay. And for our purpose, let us label these endpoints as P, Q, R and X, Y, Z. So you have to basically fill the table that finally the end result should be that uh, on the left hand side, if you write P, Q, R, then on the right hand side, what is the correspondence? That is it X, Y, Z, X, Z, Y. So there are like three factorial possible combinations, right? But only one of them will be right. So we have to find out. So by the way, I, I, this is kind of a, it's not a new puzzle in the sense that it has been around on the internet for a while. So anybody already knows this puzzle, you can raise your hand. Okay. Nobody knows then that's a good thing. So one important thing to mention this circuit tester, right? I mean, the, the wires that come out of the circuit tester are quite short. So you, you cannot have a proposal like I will. Uh, connect one end door here and one end door here. And this is my circuit tester. That will not work. You don't have 10 kilometer long wires. Okay. So whatever experiment you have to do, you have to do on one side only. But of course, what you can do, you can go to one side, maybe you know, tie up the wire. So you can tie P and Q together. Okay. And so of suppose if you tie P and Q together and you then go to the other side, to the right side, and then you can pairwise check every combination. You can check whether X, Y, X, Z, Y, Z, which of them are connected to each other. So you can do those kind of experiments. Okay. So then, yeah, so this is, this is how you can probably start to think about this problem.
So yes, in the case of three wires, what will happen? What will you do first? What will you do next? So like I have an idea, we will tie a PQ and okay. then go PQ. to yes, okay. then go to other end and find uh, which um, means which two wire plug and lighter. Okay, let us say we find that X and Y. I mean, when you connect the circuit tester, you find that X and Y are completing the circuit. Yes. So therefore, what so, can we deduce? Uh, Z is connected to R. Yes. So I mean, we know that one of PQ is connected to X Y, but we don't know in what order. But we can definitely say that R and Z are connected, right? Everybody agrees with this. So therefore, R and Z, at least we can fill up this part, but this still we don't know yet. Okay, then after that, what should we do? So we go again that side, then we untie PQ and join QR. Okay, so now we untie PQ and now we join QR, okay? Yeah, and then, and then we go uh, that side and again find P. and as we find P, we will got Q. Yes. Okay. So, so when you come to this side, uh, now now that you know that R is connected to Z, so now whichever is complete the circuit, let us say that Z and Y complete the circuit, then we know that Y has to be equal to Q, and therefore P has to be equal to X, right? So does everybody agree with this strategy? So first we type PQ. So if you just write, so come to uh, city A. Okay, city A. Uh, Tie PQ, then go to city B, then test and find Z, then back to A, uh, tie QR, and then go to B, and then test and find Y, X. Okay. So, how many total, I mean, how much expense did you have to bear? So, we have to go from A to B, then again back to A. And back to me. So total three trips. So you have to spend 300 rupees to travel, right? So can you think of a way to reduce the cost? So one question for you, Om. So uh, the first step I agree that first we tie PQ, we go to the other side and we find out what is Z. So up to this point, I don't have any problem. Now, I mean, why do you want to come back to A? without doing anything. See, there is the perfect symmetry, right? A and B are not like biased in any way. So whatever you want to do at A side, can't you do the same at B side? Yes. Okay. So okay. I mean, got yeah. it. Right. And why? Yeah, let us, so, so this is how we can proceed. So I mean, if I draw a diagram, so the first diagram will look like this. So we join PQ, we come to this side. So right now we travel for the first time from here to here. Then we do the circuit testing. Let us say we find out that these two are connected. So therefore we can conclude that R and Z are joined. And now what we do here itself, uh, like second diagram. Now that we know that Z is equal to something. So let us join Z and Y. Okay. So I join Z and Y. I come back to P uh, on come back to the left hand side. I will untie the PQ now. Okay. So we, we can tie and untie obviously. So now PQR are again three separate threads and out of that, I already know that R is already equal to Z. So then now I just have to test which of Q and P are joined to R. So if we find that Q and R are completing the circuit, it means that Q has to be Y. So in just two trips, I can finish the problem, right? Okay. So, so basically in two trips, you can finish the problem. Okay, so I, I think hopefully everybody has followed this logic and understand that how you can think about this problem and realize the important kind of clue here that the reason why we were to figure out that R is the same as Z because it was the only wire which was not connected to anything else. But see, within P and Q, there was ambiguity. We, we could not say whether PQ are joined like that or like that. So both were possible. But the fact that R was connected to nothing and Z was connected to nothing allowed us to solve the problem. Okay, so uh, finally you have to solve the problem. So we currently solved the problem of three wires. Finally, you have to solve the problem of 120 wires. Okay, so maybe let us do a few more intermediate problems. So let us do the problem of six wires. Okay, so now you have six wires on the left side. And now let instead of calling them ABCD, let us start to give them some systematic name. So let us say the, so this is city A, right? Okay. 
So we'll call these as a1, a2, up to a6. And here also we have b1 to b6. Okay, and again you have to fill up the table that a1, like a1, a2, a6 corresponds to what? And again, try to do this in as few tricks as possible. Actually, let me not use the letter A and B because I will require A and B for some other purpose. Uh, when we do the solution, let me replace them with maybe left and right, right? So let me call it L and R, city L and city R. Okay. So L1, L2, L6, and R1, R2, R6. But I think everybody understood the basic workflow that what is the process in which we will go to do, we are going to try this problem that you will tie a few ends together on one side, then go to the other side, test various combinations of wires and see which of them are connected, which of them are not connected. And that will give you the information. See, there is no cost to be paid for how many times you tie and untie the wire or how many pairs of wires you test. So that you can do as many times as you want. The cost is coming from traveling between the two cities. So that is the, what you need to minimize. So try to do as much work as possible on one side before you travel to the other side. And like before we try to find the optimum solution, I think we can all agree that there is one very bad solution, which is there, which is we have to find out one wire at a time. See what we did in the previous question, right? So suppose in this problem, we want to find out which wire L1 is connected to. So what we can do, we can join all the other wires. Let us say, you know, we connect all the other wires together, L2 to L6. And then we go to the other side and we just keep on testing, right? And then we will find some wire which is not connected to anything else. So once we look at that wire, that has to be L1. So like that, one, one wire at a time, you can of course do it. But then with that process, you will require six trips to do it that way. But if nothing else works, this solution is there that you go, go at it one wire at a time.
okay one more question suppose we uh, because you know six is such a nice number that you can group the six wires in groups of maybe two two wires each right so somebody can say let us tie l1 and l2 together uh let us tie uh, no like that pairwise l2 l3 uh, sorry l3 l4 l5 l6 so we make these kind of groups and then we go to the other side and we then start testing the pairs so what will happen in that case <clears throat> we'll probably come up with the pairs so maybe for example we will find that r1 and r4 are connected okay like something like that maybe r1 and r4 are completing the circuit test so which means that r1 r4 pair are connected to one of the pairs on the left hand side and similarly you will you will find other pairs but that alone is not sufficient to know which pair corresponds to which other pair right because r1 r4 could be connected to any of these three pairs so there is still a lot of ambiguity like actually we are i mean not simplifying the problem that much if we connect it in pairs like this so uh, i mean 6 is a nice number in that sense that it is divisible as groups of 2 to each but 6 is also a nice number for other reasons so what other reason can you think of that 6 is such a nice number Earlier we did the problem of three wires, correct? So we did the problem of three wires. Now we are doing the problem of six wires. Finally, you have to do the problem of 120 wires. Okay. These are actually very nice numbers, all of them. What is so nice about these numbers? So we did the problem of three wires. So we can extrapolate those facts and use six and uh, like do the problem of six wires, uh, like three th grouping them into three, three each. Uh, so the difficulty is if you know try to apply the three wire concept here. So what we'll do, we'll first we know connect two wires together. Let, let us say we join L1 and L2 together. So let us say we are thinking, let us solve the problem for L1, L2, L3. Now you go to the other side. Uh, see in the three wire case, what happened? That Z was the only one which was not connected to anything. So we could say that Z is definitely connected to R. Here, now how, how do you know which wire is connected to L3? Because there will be so many wires here which are not connected to anything else. So the problem is this L4, L5, L6 are kind of interfering with our problem, right? That we don't know which of the wires L4, L5, L6 are connected to. Yes. If you can think of a way of solving that problem, that you can eliminate that these, these wires are definitely not part of the L1, L2, L3. How will you eliminate that? Otherwise, you are thinking in the right direction, actually. So like if we uh, come, uh, tie three wires to the left hand side, you will get the three wire right hand side also. They yes. are connected. Yes. Correct. In some order. Uh, yes. yes. Now, so, in right hand side, we yes. will tie two wires, one from uh, the first set and one from other set. And then we will go left hand and then we will get two wires there in, with labels. Yes. And then? And then we do similar process. We take one wire from that blue set and one wire from black set. Okay. And we will do so. Okay. So, so how many trips will you require total? Seven. I think four. Four trips. Okay. Yes. So let me understand the process. I think mostly you are on the right track, but uh, we can do even better. Let me understand what you are saying. So uh, can you tell me from the beginning that which wires we are going to connect together? Like uh, first three. First three. Okay. So we'll connect yeah. one, two, three. Okay. And then? And then then we go right hand side and find which three wires are like. Okay. All from labor. Yeah, so suppose we find that R1, R2, R3 are all connected to each other. So we know that R1, R2, R3 as a whole are mapping to L1, L2, L3 in some order. Okay. Yes. Okay, now what do we do after that? Now let we will take uh, suppose R4 and R1. Okay, okay. And we tie them. So so basically what, what OM has done is we are able to reduce the problem to the three wire case now because the first three wires are out of the picture. So now it is only between L4, R4, R5, R6 and L4, L5, L6, right? 
So then you will follow the procedure of the three wires to you know map these set together, correct? Yes. Sir. Yeah. So then for that you will require two trips, right? From here to here you have to go once and then come back. So yes. two trips, but at the end of those two trips, these these three wires will be completely mapped, and then after that you have to solve the problem of the top top two combinations. So then that will require further two trips, right? So total you are requiring five trips. Okay. One, two, three, four, five. Yes, sir. I think that's uh... yeah. But in in the process, we are thinking on the right direction actually. So what I'm asking is that see when you when you go from city left to right, you know you are going to solve the first three uh, wires are going to get connected anyways. So in that why 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 don't we start solving L four L five L six in parallel? Like why don't why don't we try to solve that simultaneously? So if you want to do it that way, what should we do at the very beginning? So what I'm suggesting is that, so first step is right, what you're saying, let us connect L1, L2, L3 together, okay? And assuming that we are going to solve the problem of the first three wires, what is the process we decided to follow for the remaining three wires as per the first part? That out of those three wires, we'll tie some two wires together, right? Yes. So why don't we do both steps in one go? And now we go to the other side. And now what will happen over there? That again, through trial and error, we'll find that there is some group of three wires which are joined to each other. And whatever is that group, that has to be the first group, right? So the, this group of three wires will be joined to some group of three wires. So again, without loss of generality, let them be the first three wires. And so now, and then again, through the testing through R4, R5, R6, we will find some two wires. So if I color code this, right? So this, this group of three red wires will correspond to some group of three red wires over here and the, for the same for the blue wires right i'll find out that let us say that r4 and r5 are joined to l4 l5 so now can we say that like what can we say now yeah like uh, l6 is connected to r6 yes, correct so l6 and r6 are the unique ones because they, those are the only ones which are not connected to anything else so we can fill the table that way and understand that we have all done all of this with only single trip so right now we have only traveled once from A to B or city left to city right. Okay, now we are at city on the right hand side. So what should we do now? Sir, uh, we can like tie uh, R4, R3 and R6, R1. Okay, let me erase this mark. So you are saying let us tie R4, R3 and R6, R1. R6, R1. Or yes, or yes, sir. Okay. So, like in left hand side, we will get uh, any wire for R1, and by the Z and do set, we will get for R3, R4, yes. and R5, and R2. Okay, yes. It's... yes. So, now if we come to the left hand side, now we'll come to the left hand side and untie this. But we know that, uh, I mean, we already had established that L1, L2, L3 corresponds to R1, R2, R3. So, uh, I mean, whichever wire L6 uh, it shows, shows connectivity to, let us say that L6 and L1 are connected. Uh, I mean, they complete the circuit, which means that L1 has to be equal to R1. Okay. Then after that, how do you find R3, R4? Because we know that basically, like there will be some wire from R to L4 and L5. Yes, correct. Correct. Because R2, R3 are from the L2, L3 set. So let us say that we find that L3 and L4 are joined. So it means that th those have to be the corresponding. So we know that L3 corresponds to R3 and L4 corresponds to R4. And now, so what which is the remaining wire L2 will be connected to R2. Okay. So it, yeah, I think it is possible to do it this way. And so yeah, how many trips will be required for this? So we have to go only once from left to right and once from right to left. So only two trips were required. So it is interesting that 
for three wires also we require two trips and for six wires also we require two trips so this is my claim that for 120 wires also require two trips in fact for any number of wires you can solve this problem with just two trips okay but i will not disclose the algorithm for that i'll give it uh, as an open problem for you we'll discuss next time but one important property we used in all of this about 3 6 and 120 because if you notice the very first like if i go back to the very first uh, way we are connected right we connected l1 l2 l3 together right then we connected l4 l5 together and then we connected we left l6 without any connection so the reason why we are able to discover the groups on the rhs is that for every uh, like the number of wires which are connected to each other the the, the uh, groups are all distinct in the sense that if i find a group with three wires connected to each other then that can probably correspond to the first set which was not the case in the previous suggestion that when i said let us join two two wires in that case even if we go to the right hand side and discover the two two wire pair we cannot map them because we don't know which combination of two wires correspond to which combination over here but here that mapping was clear so why is that possible what is the property about three six and i'll give you the next number in that series 10 Triangular numbers. Triangular numbers. The triangular numbers. Okay, so that is the most important property to use. That you can divide. So in the case of ten, what will happen? Uh, you can join the wires as you know four, a group of four, three, two, and one, right? And then on the right hand side, you will go and you start testing all the pairs, and you will find that there are some four wires which are all joined to each other. So we can be sure that those four wires correspond to the first set in some order. So like that, you will get three wires, two wires, and single wire. Okay, so you can establish those sets within the set, the order is still unknown, but this is a very important first step. Okay, so I think this much hint is sufficient for you to think you can solve the problem completely. And uh, I mean, Ohm's also solution is correct, but the slight difficulty I have that it is not very systematic, that it's not clear how this solution is generalized to a larger problem. So try to come up with a more systematic solution, which can be easily to generalize to any triangular number. Okay, so yeah, so this was one puzzle I wanted to share with you. So we can call this, I don't know, wire matching puzzle. Okay, so we'll refer to this as the wire matching puzzle next time. And I mean, I don't know, uh, somewhere in like 100 years ago, somebody might have actually faced this problem that ideally you should not to put a telegraph cable without labeling the wires. But if somebody did that, uh, you, you have to solve the question somehow, right? Then this could be one way. And I mean, the difficulty is that. So somebody, I shared this puzzle in another class earlier and they said that, you know, you should have a mobile phone on both ends that I, why don't, should one person keep traveling back and forth? It, it is so wasteful, right? You just call the other person and tell them to do this. But the difficulty is we are in an era where we did not have mobile phones. So the, I mean, this telegraph cable is the way to communicate. So the only alternative was to physically travel between the two ends. And I mean, here I'm just saying city A and city B are 10 kilometers apart. But I mean, as you may know that we have cables across the Pacific Ocean, which connect the European continent to American continent with like thousands of kilometers long. So there it will be prohibitively expensive to travel thousand kilometers every time you want to match two wires. So, I mean, yeah, I mean, it is not a completely unexpected problem as such. Okay. So this was one question. Uh, then there is another family of questions, which we had started to explore earlier related to basically binary numbers. Okay. So binary, binary related puzzles are there. Okay. And there is a, so we'll do some examples of this, but before that, there is one more category of puzzles, which is very interesting, uh, which I technically they come in the theory of logic. Okay. So logic theory puzzles, because the what you're going to study in the context of these puzzle has some very important implications for theory of logic as a whole. Uh, and the, the reason why those implications occur is this. So, you know, right now you and I, we all solve problems. We like to do mathematics. We do it on by writing symbols, basically, right? What is finally, what is a theorem? It is just a set of symbols which you write on paper, right? 
and uh, I mean there is a certain grammar that we have to follow. So we all understand that what is a even something like English, right? English you write sentences. They have a grammatical structure, and anybody can identify whether that sentence is logically correct or not. And I mean, we have like uh, spelling checker, grammar check is part of Microsoft Word and other software for a long time. So the fact that computers can automatically check the validity of a certain sentence is not a new idea for us. So we have already computers which can check grammar. Okay. So to check grammar of any language is already part of what computers can do. Okay. Okay. So in theory, given any logical you know, gram grammar and grammar does not have to be English grammar. That's what I'm saying that, you know, writing a, a logical proof of Pythagoras theorem that is also comprises of statements. Any statement has to follow certain rules and computers can check whether the that proof is correct or not. So basically we already have computer program like software to check proofs. Okay. We already have this. Okay, we have software that can check proofs. So the next logical question is can we have software to write proofs? Okay, can software write proofs? So on a very basic point, one can say technically, yes, in the sense we can always have a software which keeps generating larger and larger random sequence of characters, right? And we all know that, you know, if let us say we, English has 26 alphabets. Okay. Okay. So basically all strings of length one, 26 is to one strings of length one are there. 26 square strings of length two are there and so on and so forth. So like if somebody claims that suppose there exists a Pythagoras theorem proof. Okay. Uh, that requires. 1000 characters. Okay. So if you take the set of all possible sequences of 1000 characters, it's a very long, obviously very large set, but it is a finite set. So if we have, you know, computer program, which runs through every possible combination of 1000 characters and keeps checking that which of them is a proof, eventually it is going to find the proof of Pythagoras theorem. Okay. So in very, you know, at a very basic level, can software write proof? The answer has to be yes. Is it practical? No, obviously not. I mean, I'm sure this number is much larger than maybe the, I don't know, number of atoms in the universe or something like that. So the, at, uh, we have no definite plan to create this kind of a brute force mechanism, but we are thinking that realm of mathematical possibility where no number is too large. So as given a sufficiently powerful and fast computer, any software can write proofs. But the question is, can software write all proofs? Okay. And at first glance, it may seem that it should be able to write. I mean, I don't see the problem in that. But th that is not such a simple question that whether every possible statement or theorem can be proven automatically with the machine. That is something which we don't know. And uh, we may be interesting that this is where finally the length, this theory is going to go. But the starting point is something very simple called some logic theory puzzles. Okay. So I'll say an example of this family. Okay. And there are, you'll find many more ex examples of this in the books written by one author. I think I must have shared the name of this author before also Raymond Smulya. Okay. So he has been, he, like rather I'd say, he was a mathematician, worked deeply in the theory of logic for a long time. And he has written many logic puzzles, books like that. Like one very famous book that he wrote is called, what is the name of this book? Okay, so that is the name of that book. What is the name of this book? So that already gives you a flavor that what kind of you know, thinking will be involved in his work. Like all sorts of logical paradoxes, interesting properties you will find in his work. So let me just share one very nice example of his this kind of work, okay? So, uh, I mean, there's a lot of context and story behind it. I will not share that, but basically there is a machine. Okay. So there is some machine. Okay. Which takes input and generates some output. Okay. And so it operates on numbers. Okay. So basically you have to feed a number and here you are talking of natural numbers and you will get output will also be a number. Okay. And there are some rules that what kind of numbers it will accept and what is the output will generate. Okay. So, so for example, let us say there is a rule one. Okay. Rule one says that uh, 2x 
generates x okay for all x okay so one clarification this number does not work in uh, mathematical operation it does not add subtract multiply it only joins strings so 2x does not mean 2 times x it is simply the digit 2 followed by x okay so 2x like so if x is like 400 so if x is 400 2x is not 800 2x is simply 2400 okay so this as per rule number one if you put 2 to 2400 inside the machine you will get 400 out okay so this is rule number one okay and rule number two if x generates y then 3x generates y to y okay so just to continue the example we did before so we know that 2400 generates 400 so therefore what this rule is says if you add a 3 to that so if you write 3 to 4 0 0 and you feed this number to the machine what you get at output is again y to y so 4 0 0 2 4 0 0 this will come as the output okay so these are the only two rules that will work for now okay so 2x generates x and if x generates y then 3x generates y to y okay so this is a machine that is given to you and so the surprising thing is of course this machine looks very simple that you may think how is this machine going to be useful to do anything but it may surprise you to know that with the right encoding this machine can generate something like Pythagoras theorem okay so such a simple set of rules like this can also generate very complex outputs with the right you know manipulation okay but we'll so we'll I'll start to ask questions about this machine. So, okay, so question one. Okay, find a number n such that n generates itself. Okay, and I hope the rules are clear and the operation that we are joining the numbers. We are not doing any arithmetic operation. We are just joining the numbers together. Anushka, you have found it? Yes, sir. Oh, just a minute, let everybody try. Okay, so maybe Anushka, can you share the example? Uh, yes, sir, 
Yes, I think this looks correct, right? Because what, basically what will happen? 23 generates 3. So 3, 2, 3 will generate 3, 2, 3. Correct. Uh, anybody else has a different example or the same one? Om, you have a different one? No. Okay, same. So, okay, so everybody agrees that we can find numbers such that n generates itself. Okay. Uh, maybe next question, find all numbers with have this property. So 3 to 3 is obviously one example, but is it the only example or we can have more? I had a question about the rules. Yes, go ahead. In, in the first rule, uh, suppose if we uh, put 203, then mm -hmm. we get 03. We like we consider the 02, right? We consider the 0 also because we are working with pure strings. Yes, I'm just wondering when I'm trying this problem because I have not thought about this before. Yes, Kano. I just realized that my solution was wrong. Okay. Okay. So actually, I don't know the full uh, solution of this one, but just thinking aloud that how you approach this problem. Like you have to find every possible number which has this property. So first thing you have to realize is that the very last rule that will apply cannot be rule one, right? Because rule one will always reduce the length of your input string. So therefore the last rule to be applied has to be rule two. Okay. So in other words, just before the rule two is applied. So let us say, let us say that there is a first string a1, a2. Okay. Let us. And this is generating b1, b2, pl. And now to this, if you apply rule two, we'll get that three, three, a one, a two, a K will generate B one, B two, BL 
followed by two, followed by again P1, P2, PL. Okay. So we are assuming that this is the last step before. So in other words, this number is identical to itself. That is what we are assuming. Okay. They are both equal. So then we can start to compare it digit by digit, right? So first thing is what can we say about the length K and L? How are they going to be related? So K1 would be equal to 12 plus 1. Right. Uh, K, sorry, K plus 1. Sorry. K plus 1 is equal to 12 plus 1. K plus 1 has to be equal to 12 plus 1. In other words, K has to be equal to 12. Okay. That's the first thing. And then if you know, if you write this one below the other digit by digit, then uh, what we are going to get, like this is 3, A1, A2, up to uh, somewhere in between you will have A, L, A, L plus 1 up to A, 2, L, right? So this is the left hand side and below that if I write B1, B2, B3 uh, up to B, L, then 2, then again B1, B2 up to B, L. So like these terms are to match up exactly. So we will get a number of relations, right? So basically first thing is that B1 has to be equal to 3. And then A1 is B2, A2 is B3. So like this, this entire range of matching will give us one set of rules, right? All the way up to AL minus one has to be equal to PL. Then AL is equal to two. And then again, the, the rest of it has to match up that right? AL plus one is equal to P1. A2L is equal to PL. Okay. So it would also mean that B2 is equal to um, 2 and A L plus 1 will be 3. Why is B2 equal to 2? So because B2 is equal to... Oh, oh sorry, sorry. Uh, we don't know for sure. Um. But sir, A L plus 1 will be 3. A L plus 1 is equal to B1, right? But uh, we don't know whether it is 2 or 3, right? No, but B1 is 3, right? B1 is 3, yes. Oh, yes, yes. Therefore, this is 3, yes, right. Yeah, but anyway, actually, I don't know about this problem more. But you see, even the most basic rules uh, already we are dealing with a problem which may be difficult to solve. I don't know if it's impossible to solve, but it's definitely difficult. So finding all numbers which satisfy this property is an open question for you. Okay. So uh, in the same way, so we, this was find a number n such that n generates n. Uh, slightly different question I can ask. So question two, find a number n such that n generates 2n. So you also you're just adding a digit, right? We are just adding a digit to the left hand side.
Yes, Anushka. Sir, three two two three. Three two three. No, oh, three. Three two two three. Three two two three. Okay, interesting. Why? Because uh, we know that two two three generates twenty three. So therefore, three two two three will generate two three followed by two and two three. Yes, correct. Yes, this looks correct. Okay. So anyway, I, I, there are many such puzzles that you can do of this kind. So I, I will leave it as an open uh, topic for you. So the most general puzzle of this kind, you can ask this to question three. For any uh, for any string or any number uh, a, find the n such that n generates a n. Okay. So in other words, you can prepend the n with any arbitrary string that you want. So for example, here the a a was two, but doesn't have to be. So any string you can take and you can find a way to generate a natural number such that n will generate a n. So this is the most general example of this kind. Okay, and uh, so here, uh, just to complete this topic, so what is the significance of this? So actually, what it turns out is that these operations, like basically, if you think of it, what does two two is going to uh, reduce one digit from the LHS? Okay, why? Because two n becomes n, then three doubles. Uh, the sequence, right? Because, uh, like if if x produces y, then three x produces y to y. So actually, the original sequence gets doubled, and so on and so forth. So you can introduce more rules this way, and which are all doing fundamental string operations. So if you think about it, actually, what this machine is actually just a string manipulation machine. Okay, so it actually is a like basically a string manipulation machine. And if you go back to what we discussed at the very start of this uh, topic, that how if you wanted to generate a machine that can write all proofs, basically it has to manipulate strings only. So you know by applying these rules repeatedly, it can generate every string that it needs to process. So that is why these kind of machines can be used to build this kind of software, like proof writing software, basically. Okay. Uh, I mean, but this is a very, I cannot introduce this topic in half an hour. So this is a very basic level of introduction. If you want more examples of this type and you want to dive deep into this theory, uh, the author Raymond Spulian, I mean, the book which I re recommend is called The Lady or the Tiger. Okay. This is an amazing book. Okay. Uh, by, by the same author, Raymond Spulian. And this, the second half of this book is all about this kind of logic puzzles. Okay. With that done, let me jump to a third topic. So as I said that uh, we would like to have some examples of binary number puzzles. Okay, so binary number puzzles. Okay. We had already started with this uh, to some extent in the previous lecture, but uh, we could not complete it. So I just want to share a few more examples. Uh, and just to revise that what are binary numbers, I think, I mean, everybody knows at this point uh, that basically it's a way of representing numbers in a <clears throat> base two manner. So, like a number like one zero one one zero in binary represents that each each place represents a power of two. Okay, and so therefore the total value of this can be computed by <clears throat> adding the digits which are non-zero. So here, if for example, it is two plus four plus sixteen, so that is twenty-two. Okay, so like that, we can convert back and forth between binary and any other base. Uh, and the importance of binary numbers is, of course, because you know all software and computers, all of them deal with binary numbers in a big way. So one interesting thing that we can do with binary puzzles. So let, in fact, let me pose this as a puzzle. So uh, you know there is a room in which there are there is a light bulb. Okay, so there is a light bulb in a room, uh, and uh, <clears throat> uh, no, I mean instead of that, let me say it is a uh, safe okay so there is a, a combination lock okay and so you know the combination lock has multiple digits or in this case it has bits okay so let us say that it has some seven bits okay and you have to crack open the safe okay so each digit can be zero or one zero or one etc 
let us say eight bits actually. This is all one. So total, how many possible combinations are there to be tried? Two hundred and fifty-six, right? Two is to eight. And only one of them is the right password. So if you keep trying manually, like if you try all zeros, then you'll try all zeros but one, etc. Okay. So you have to keep trying all the combinations all the way to all ones. Okay. There is no other alternative. You have to try all the two fifty six combinations, and one of them will open the lock. Okay. But the thing is that if we go in strictly binary order, right? Like basically, uh, like if you write all the numbers, like all zeros are there, then all zeros except the last one is one. Then uh, if you go with this one one like that, if you go, then you'll exhaustively cover all the combinations, but Every time you change one bit, right? So here you are changing zero to one. Here you are changing zero to one, and you are changing this one back to zero. So every time you change a bit, you have to pay a price. Maybe you know it takes one second to change that number. So you want to minimize the number of changes that you need to make, and still cover all the possibilities. Okay. So like to share an example of a less number of bits. Let us say we are only working with two bits. Okay. So in the natural order of things, I can. Like if you are writing decimal system, then I can write zero, one, two, three, and convert them into their binary representation. So I will get this pattern. But here, like from here to here, how many bits I am changing? I change one bit. From here to here, I need to change two bits, and then from here to here again, I need to change one bit, and then from here to if I have to come back to the original sequence, then again I have to change two bits. But I can arrange these four. I don't have to try in this order necessarily. What if I try it in this order? First, I try zero zero, then I try zero one, then I try one one, and then I try one zero. So if you see this sequence of events in every step, I'm going to change only one bit, right? Because from here to here, I'm only changing this one bit. Then here I'm changing one bit, then one bit, and one bit. So by just changing one bit at a time, also you can cover all the possibilities. So the question is, can we do this for a larger number of bits? So here we did it for two bits. Can we do it for three bits, four bits, eight bits? Like ultimately, for to solve this combination law, how many bit changes are you required to check all the possible combinations? And so I mean, ideally the answer has to be two fifty six or two fifty five actually, because I mean, from the last step you don't have to come back to the original as such. But uh, I, I mean, so this is the question that how do you cover all the possibilities with changing only one bit at a time? Okay, so we did it for two bits. So maybe before we jump to the largest problem, let us try to do the three bit question first. Okay, so now the question is: You have let us say you have three bits to be manipulated. And if I go in the natural order, like if I just take all the numbers from zero to seven and write their binary representation, then you will see that we are have to do too many bit changes in between. Like look at this particular, like from when you go from three to four, all the bits change. So that is not ideal. So can you arrange the numbers in such way, way that only one bit has to be changed in every step?
and you see for the two bit case how this circular arrangement was very useful to see that not only you can do it changing one bit at a time but at the end you can come back to the original sequence of all zeros also so you try to arrange the same thing for three bit case so uh, the diagram can do something like this that you start with all zeros then you have to travel through all the sequences and then finally reach back to all zeros uh, all the time changing only one bit Yes, Anushka. So select tell the sequence. Yes. So we start with all zeros. Yes. And then zero one zero. Zero one zero. Okay. Zero one one. Zero one one. Zero zero one. Zero zero one. One zero one. One zero one. One one zero. Sorry, one one one. One one one. Then one one zero. One zero. Then one zero zero. One zero. Yes. Yeah. Looks like we have covered all the eight possibilities, and we are changing only one bit at a time. Anybody else? Other different sequence? Sir, we can change from one uh, zero one one to directly one one one. 0, 1, 1, directly to 1, 1. In, in the same sequence or you want me to start with a new one? Uh, like first three terms are same. Oh, let us still write one. So, 0, 0, 0, then 0, 1, 0, then 0, 1, 1, then what do we do? 1, 1, 1. 1, 1, 1, okay. Then 1, 1, 0. 1, 1, 0. Then 1, 0, 0. 1, 0, 0. Then 1, 0, 1. 1, 0, 1. And 0, 0, 1. Oh, sorry, zero, zero, one. Yes. Oh. Yeah, this also looks better. So the question is, because we want to do this for larger and larger uh, numbers, right? Uh, do we have a systematic approach or we are doing with trial and error? So that is the first question. That how can we guarantee that this can be always be continued for larger and larger number of bits? <laughs> Okay, so let me share one solution which has a very nice visual representation also because you know we have been doing lots of other things like coordinate geometry. So very surprising to know that there is a you know flavor of coordinate geometry also to this problem. Uh, let me show how. So let us return to the two bit question. Okay, so uh, let us consider the x y plane. Okay, okay. So this is the x axis. This is the y axis. And so we know in the origin is called zero comma zero, or in in instead of writing it as zero comma zero. I'll write it as 0, 0. Okay, so we understand 0. If I write it as 0, 0, it means the first coordinate is the x coordinate, first digit is the x coordinate, second digit is the y coordinate. Then this point, can I write it as 1, 0? Because that is the x coordinate is 1, y coordinate is 0. Then this is 1, 1, and this is 0, 1. So do you see the problem is actually how do you travel across this like to 1 cross 1 square visiting all the vertices? And so the solution that we had was like this, right? So, if I go around this square in this way, 
every time i travel one unit distance i will only change one bit right because if i travel in this direction i will be changing the y coordinate if i travel in this direction i will be changing the x coordinate so this loop uh, covers all the possibilities in the same way the reverse direction is also possible right but in any direction i go i will be covering all the points uh, and uh, like changing only one bit one bit at a time so can you think of how to generalize this for the three bit question now what will the diagram you draw sir like a cube yeah cube right so we'll take three dimensional system so x y and z axis and so here again the origin will be 0 0 0 this will be 1 0 0 and so like that if i i, I don't have to label all the points but I think can you everybody agree that all the vertices of the cube, this unit cube, right? So the uh, this bottom left corner is all zeros, and the corresponding opposite corner on this is all ones. And every vertex will represent a unique combination of zeros and ones. So now again the question is you have to travel and cover all the vertices of the cube and then come back to the origin. And remembering this. Uh, you see how the previous problem is embedded in this because what is a cube finally? It corresponds of squares, right? So in particular, you can think of it as the bottom plane. So the bottom plane is already, if you ignore the z-axis, then the bottom plane already solved the problem. And the top plane is also another square, right? So you are just taking two squares and joining them together. So like if you start by solving the problem, ignoring the z-axis, then in the bottom plane, we can travel this path, right? I'll start from the origin. I'll go this way, this way, this way, right? And now here, if I come back to the origin, then I've finished that loop early, but I don't want to do that. So what should I do? Go up. Go up, right? So from here, I'll go up. I'll go here. And now what I'll do is I'll traverse the same loop in the reverse direction. So I'll go this way, this way, this way, and then I'll rejoin. So this pattern that first you solve the bottom half of the problem, then you go one level up, then you solve the same problem in the reverse direction, and then you rejoin. So how to interpret that? Like this is a geometric interpretation which looks very nice. But how do you translate it in terms of the actual solution? So basically what I'm proposing. So the first four terms will be identical to the four two bit case, except that the first column will be all zeros. Right? So these are the first four terms of the two bit case with just a zero added. And now at this point, so here we have reached this vertex. This is corresponding to this vertex. Now, what does going up mean? One in Z. Right. Like, and now from this point, we are going to traverse in the reverse direction, which means that basically, if you think about it, this column will be report, re, re, repeating, but only in the reverse order. So now we'll have, so now the left column will remain all ones, but this will reflect. So you see the same pattern is we are changing in the opposite direction. And then after here, we'll of course come back to this. So, you know, so this reflection idea is very nice. And that is why there is a name for this sequence. It is called the reflected binary code. Okay. Short RBC. We, we use RBC also for the red blood cells. But there is another way. Or there is another name for this. This is called the gray code. I think this was the name of a person who maybe first came up with this pattern. It is called the gray code. But you see how this visual proof makes it clear that we can extend its pattern very, pattern very easily to larger numbers. Like now this three bit pattern, how will you extend to four bits? So we can do it this way, right? First, so first eight terms of that four bit at pattern will be exactly identical. So first four terms will be the same, but with just one zero added. Right? So here I'll just copy the three bit pattern as it is. Okay. 
So now I cannot draw a four dimensional diagram, but do you see that in your mind that uh, if I were to draw a four dimensional space like X, Y, Z and a W axis also somewhere, W axis. So we cannot represent 4D on, on the plane. But effectively, what I'm going to traverse is what is called a hypercube or a cube of a higher dimension. And so in the sort of gra graphical way, what it will look like is that, so these eight terms are representing the uh, first half of it. So I'm, I'm going in this order, I'm traveling it back. And at this point, I'm going to jump into that other dimension. And in that other dimension, I'm going to traverse the cube in the opposite direction. And then after that, I have to come back to this dimension. So this like interdimensional travel is happening. Okay, but I mean, we don't have to worry about that. Now the algorithm simply says we uh, repeat the terms, but now in reverse the terms. So from this point onwards, it is as the mirror image. And so we have come back to the origin. So it's a very nice property that you can arrange these terms in a cycle, like a cyclic manner, and uh, you will come back to the original term. Okay, so this was an example for gray code. And this has lots of useful practical applications. So gray codes are not just for that puzzle, but uh, many real systems are built using this kind of gray codes. Because the what is the advantage of this gray code is that See, every time you change a bit, you have to spend energy in the real circuit. So that is the number of, like the energy consumption to work through all the patterns is the minimal if you use gray code. If you use the normal, like what we had done before, like this sequence, if you just compare that how much energy will require to go through this sequence versus gray code, the savings are quite significant. So that is the advantage of using this code. And of course that saving are more and more significant for larger sequences. like. Going to 2 raised to 8, like 256. So using a gray code of size 8, you can traverse through all these combinations with only 256 bit changes. And if you, you can compute that, how much will be required to do it through the normal way? Okay. In fact, that's like an open question for you. That compute the energy required to traverse the binary sequence in natural, like natural number order and compare it to the gray code uh, cost. Okay. Uh, one interesting puzzle of a similar kind, which you can think about. Uh, so we we'll consider n bits, okay? So in other words, there are basically zeros, ones in some order, arranged in a circle. Okay, so basically you consider a circle on which there are n places, okay? So place one, place two, up to place n and in each place you either write a zero or one okay and now uh, oh sorry no that, that was not the question consider two raised to n bits okay so you have two raised to n such places well two raised to n And so now first question is how many sequences of length n of uh, basically sequences of consecutive bits okay, can be formed. So the answer is, of course, of this is 2 raised to n, because basically what we can do, we can start from every position, and from there you can look at the next consecutive n bits, okay? So you can imagine like a sliding window, that you start with the first position, you take the n bits. Now, if you slide the starting position by one place, you have to slide the end position also by one place, because the length of your sequence has to be n bits all the time. So like that, basically every bit can be the starting point of a sequence, right? And so you'll get two raised to n such sequences. The question is, can we arrange the bits in such a way that all these sequences are again unique? In other words, you are going to traverse all the two raised to n combinations without any duplicates and without missing out anything. Okay. So, I mean, as an example, suppose you take the case of n is equal to two. 
and so you write the bits in this way 0 1 1 0 okay so here if you see if i go clockwise and if i take keep taking pairs of bits so like for example here the pair is 0 1 if i shift my window by one place now the bits are 1 1 if i shift my window by one more place the bits are 1 0 and finally 0 0 so like going through the circle like one full rotation all the possibilities are coming up in the same way like for n is equal to 3 how will you arrange 8 bits of zeros and ones and of course like obviously one of them has to be all zeros right because that if whenever you reach that particular combination you will get all zeros but so how will you arrange the rest of the bits like such that if I keep going, so obviously the next bit has to be 1. So the like the first term was 0, 0, 0, then you'll get 0, 0, 1. I, but you still have to fill out the rest of the points such that if I keep going this way, all the combinations will get covered uniquely. So wouldn't we just find out the binary for the numbers like 1, 2, 3 and then do it in that order? Uh, no, sorry. Can you repeat that? So I'm saying that first was zero zero zero, which was the binary, which is yes. binary for zero. Yes. Uh, then zero zero one, which is binary for one, okay. and so on. We go on till we get one one one. No, but uh, let us try that. The difficulty is now. See the operation involved in the previous gray code was a bit change. Here now it is a bit rotation. So you know when you slide the window, what is happening? All the bits are transferring, right? So the previous zero is the is sliding in this way. So whether or not that can be done, like so here you did it. Next time also this is working out. But after that, now if you want to go to zero one one, then this is not a valid option because you cannot rotate this sequence to get this. Sequence. So how do you fill out the pattern after that is not clear to me. So we either list out all the binary and then we find out the numbers in which it is possible. So for over here, 1, 0, 1 is possible and even 1, 0, uh, 0 is possible. Okay, let us give it a try for n equal to 3. Uh, so all first three zeros are written. So that will give me the first term. Next term, let me write 1. So this 0, 0, 1 uh, is going to give me the next term. So then the uh, term after that has to be 0, right? So that I'll get 0, 1, 0. Yes. Okay. Then the one after that, what should it be? I okay. still have to fill out three more places. And now if you think about it, because I need all ones at some point. Huh. So the only way is that these all three have to be one. Yes. And now just check that in this process, are we covering all the possibilities or anything is miss missed out? So, like if I continue to slide the window, so I have already reached 0, 1, 0. Next one is now 1, 0, 1. Then 0, 1, 1. Then 1, 1, 1. Then 1, 1, 0. And finally 1, 0, 0. So, are we covering everything? Yes, we are covering, right? So, for n is equal to 3, we are able to find the pattern. But as you go for larger and larger numbers, now because now for n is equal to 4, we have to fill out 16 places right so again for n is equal to 4 the starting part i agree will be all zeros but still how to fill out the remaining 12 positions so that this pattern continues so starting four will be all zeros and the last four will be all ones so you are saying the if i go from the last one these four all will be ones yes but I mean, that is an assumption you are making. I don't know if you can deduce that that is the only possibility. And you will require all four ones somewhere, but why do they have to be the last four? They don't necessarily have to, but then one combination can be different. Yeah, so give it a try. I mean, I will not give you the answer right now, but think about it. That how will you solve the question for n equal to four? And then can it be done for any arbitrary number n? Okay, so that is something that you have to think over. So, I mean, I can we can call this as a binary shift code, okay? I don't know if there's any official name for this. Just as the previous code we called a binary reflection code, we can call this a binary shift because you know we are shifting the digits every time. So the question is, is it possible or not? Okay. So uh, I mean we have covered lots of uh, I, I don't I will probably end the lecture in the next few minutes, but 
Uh, I mean, there are so many different kinds of puzzles that we visited today. So some were related to binary numbers. Uh, some were related to this uh, machine that generates numbers. Then there are some puzzles related to, uh, at the very beginning, we did the puzzle about the wire matching. So, you know, there are so many families of puzzles that can be covered. And like these are, each of them is just the basic example of that family. So, I mean, going back to the very first table that I said that, uh, and we did not even talk about these chess puzzles. Uh, actually, the chess puzzles I would like to discuss, but I don't know if everybody knows the rules of chess. That is why, I, uh, can you raise your hand if you know the rules of chess? Like, you know all the, how the pieces move. I, I just need that. I don't need anything. You don't need to know openings. You should know how rook moves, how knight moves, how bishop moves, how queen moves. Okay, everybody. Anushka, you don't know? Yes, you also know. Okay, everybody knows. That's good then. So I'll keep that in mind. So we'll, there are lots of interesting chess puzzles that I can share. Maybe I'll just share one puzzle today, okay? Because we will we'll stop with one puzzle. So actually, this was one lecture I delivered in IIT at one point. So I mean, in so in IIT we, we have lots of events like we have electronics club, we have logic maths and logic club, and each club presents their events and many others join uh, and see that. So this was one event which I had conducted. Uh, So actually, this is a slide show. There are many slides. Like each each slide had a different puzzle which was shared. Like so, this was typical puzzles which we know that we have to find and find the answer in so and so moves. Yes, sir. Yeah, raise your hand. Sir, I forgot to lower it. Oh, okay, no problem. Okay. So, so this is one easy puzzle. So this is the game position right now, and we have to find out. And now, now white is going to play. So the last move was made by black. So the question is, what was black's last move? So as assuming that you know the rules of chess, so what what will Black's last move have been? Because I mean the Black only has one king remaining on the board. So like that, down Black square to a white square. From this here to here, right? Yes. So, which means one move before that, the black king was over here. But now the question becomes, how did white give this check? Because, the, see, the bishop is over here. It cannot suddenly appear from something. Because, you know, bishop moves diagonally. So, the bishop has to reach here to give the square, the check. But there is a pawn over here. So, bishop cannot travel from here to here. So, how did white give this check? You understand the difficulty? So everybody agrees that the previous position, the black king was over here. Uh, in fact, let me... Let us set up the position. So right now, the position is like this. And so we agreed that one move before this, the position was like this. Right? The king was here. So the last move that black played was moving the king from here to here. But how did white give this check? And did white promote to a bishop? No, but uh, uh white, it is going in this direction. Uh, so, yes. Okay. So white, white starts from the bottom and goes to the top. So white can promote to the last one. Yeah, that could be one possibility, definitely. Like if the board was re reversed, 
maybe the you know it was a pawn over here and that pawn became a bishop but uh, but here it is clearly given that that is not possible so the question is is this game position impossible or is it possible can you raise your hand if you think this is impossible in just one move or yeah, I mean, in, like if you start from the you know normal position and do some sequence of moves, can you reach this position or not? Like finally, the final position was like this. Can you reach this or not? So few people think you, it is impossible to reach, but others have not raised the hand. So I don't know if they are convinced it is not possible or they are unsure. Thinking. Okay, thinking. I'm still thinking. Okay, then I will not give you the answer. Clearly, white has to play something to reach this position. So the queen on the top row is a black, right? Uh, th that is a king. That is not a queen. Oh, okay. So now to start logically thinking that what could la white's last move can be? Can it be moving the king from here to here like that? Any move related to the king, which means the black king is already in check which will not be allowed. So we have to start. So, you know, there is one, if I go back to my slide, right, I given one very important statement, which was like the key idea behind all these puzzles. It actually comes from Sherlock Holmes. Do you know this? Anybody who has read Sherlock Holmes, he has a very famous statement he made to Watson. When you have eliminated everything that is impossible, Whatever remains has to be the truth. Even if it sounds very unlikely, there is no alternative. So we have to start eliminating possibilities now. That what, what is not possible, then whatever remains has to be the only possibility. So we clearly said the king cannot be the last move. So why did not move the king? Can, can it be the white move the pawn? Will that do anything to the king? Like if, if, if the pawn is here or here, will that have any effect on the king being already in check? No, right? Mm. Okay. Can move mm. can I move the bishop? Like, could it be that the bishop was somewhere else on the board and then it came here as the last move? But the only no. is that it has to be on this diagonal, which means it is already giving check to the black king. So even the bishop did not move. So then if all these three pieces did not move, then what moved? It seemed impossible, right? Some, but something moved. So the question is this, that something moved, but it is not there anymore. So how can that something which moved disappear? If it was captured by... Ah, if it was captured by black, obviously. So now, and I, I, I hope everybody can see the chess notation on the bottom. So you know how the squares are numbered. So currently the king is at A7. So can you tell me where the capture must have happened? On A7. On A7. Okay. No. How how will the capture happen on A7? In see here, white played something at this point, and the king became in check. So I am asking, what is it that gave the check? So we, we all agree that the king was white played something, but whatever piece that white played is not on the board anymore. And we know what happened after that. The move after that which black played is this, right? Sure. 
eight. 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 It was captured. Okay. And what was the piece? What piece can be on eight? It see, it can be any random piece. It could be a bishop on again, for example. But so then, which means that white played this move, and then black captured it. But the problem is, if white plays this move, that does not solve the problem. That black is already in check. So whatever move that white played, it put the king in check in the same move. It was a queen. It was a knight. It was a knight. Yes, there. So from this point onwards, can everybody agree that we can legally continue the game? So, so maybe the one move before that, let us say it was like this. So this is the order in which the game proceeded. So I'll start from here, continue from here. Oh, I'm only I'll just move the pieces like this. So first black played this, then white played this. So this is a discovered check. And then black captured the knight. So does everybody agree that this is a perfectly legal sequence of moves? And so in fact, it is possible to reach this position. Okay, so this is a very interesting family. I, I don't know, you may not have seen this kind of puzzle before. And this can get really difficult. And just to show how difficult it can get. And two comments about this. First is that everything is logically, there is only one unique path. There are no alternatives. That this is the only way in which the position can change. And second is, we don't make any comment about, is this a sensible move to play? If you are going to play in a tournament to win, you may not play in this way. So don't assume that people are playing to win. They are just playing as per the rules of chess. That is the only assumption. Okay. But given these two assumptions, if I just you know, scroll through this, like there are so many different puzzles. They have a color, coloring question. Like there is one very interesting puzzle where uh, there are lots of pieces on the board, but uh, the coloring is not given. We don't know which puzzle is which one. So this is one very interesting position. Look at the question being asked at the bottom. What was the first move of the black team? So in other words, it is possible to logically deduce the entire history of this game because see where the black king has landed up. The starting position of the black king was here. So from here, the black king has traveled here. And the claim is that there is only one unique sequence of moves which can give this. And then you have this where you have to find out which of these pieces were white and which of them are black. And then something extreme is called insane restore dynamics because we can work out the last 96 moves from this position. Okay, so I mean, these are we, we generally won't get the time to visit all these things in the context of Olympiads, but it is still very interesting. And so, this book by again Arvind Muljan, who has done this retrograde analysis to a large extent, and there is one website also where, like, this is a community of people who discuss these kind of problems, and you can construct your own problems also. In fact, I have constructed my own retrograde analysis problems, which I'll be happy to share with you at some point. But yeah, this is a very fun logical puzzle exercise that you can think about. Okay, but with that, we'll stop for today. Uh, because as I said, that we want to take a break from Olympiad work. But we will resume with some problem solving, some theory from next lecture onwards. But in the meanwhile, I encourage you to think about all of these things that, you know, try solving puzzles, not just because they're entertaining, but they have, some of them have very deep implications in terms of theory of logic. Uh, the fact that we can at some day maybe try to build a computer that can prove many theorems, maybe not all theorems, but many theorems. So there are some very important implications of this as well. Yeah. Okay. That's all then. Again, happy Diwali to you and see you next time. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Bye. Happy Diwali. Bye, Bye sir. Happy Diwali. Happy Diwali. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Bye. Yes, sir. Happy Diwali. Thank you, sir.